All right, engineers, in this video, we're gonna talk about COVID-19. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, engineers, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about the virology aspect of COVID-19. So we know that COVID-19 is the disease that we're gonna be discussing. But the thing we have to focus on first is what is the virus that we believe is responsible for this disease, COVID-19? And that's what we think that it's actually a specific coronavirus called SARS. CoV-2. And SARS-CoV-2 is actually very interesting because what we know about SARS-CoV-2 is it's a part of the coronavirus family. So there's an 80% genetic similarity between the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the coronavirus that was responsible for the SARS outbreak in 2002-2003, as well as the MERS outbreak that occurred in 2012. And again, there's about an 80% genetic similarity between the SARS-CoV-2 virus and those viruses as well. And again, it's a coronavirus, a beta coronavirus. What we know that SARS-CoV-2 is responsible for causing is this disease that we call COVID-19. All right, so we understand the virus. We understand the disease that it causes. What, what, it, what we have to really do now is to kind of look just a little bit at that viral structure. What are some significant components of the virus that is necessary for us to understand the pathophysiology? So the first thing that we have here is we have our viral structure here. There's specific protein components on the outer side of this virus. What are those proteins and what are their significance? We're gonna talk about two particular ones that are, we're really gonna focus on. This red protein here that is expressed on the outer surface of this virus is the most important one. It's the most relevant one to the pathophysiology. And this is called the spike protein. Okay, this is called the spike protein. The next one, which is also believed to be very significant to uh, attaching and fusing and infecting the particular cells of the body, is another protein on this surface of this virus, which is called hemagglutinin esterase protein. And this guy they believe that these two proteins are the proteins on the virus that we need in order to attach to particular host cells that express this particular protein called ACE2, as well as fuse and push the virus into those cells. So again, these are two particular proteins that I want you to remember that are responsible truly for infecting these cells. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna put little asterisks next to these guys. These are very specific. The other proteins, because we should be consistent, very thorough, and understand a little bit more, there's other proteins here. This pink one is called an M protein. And this blue one, or this baby blue one, we should be more specific, is referred to as the envelope, or E protein. Now, that's the proteins on the surface. Inside, right, you have this purple structure. This purple structure is believed to be the envelope, okay? So the purple structure is believed to be the envelope of this virus. So this is going to be the envelope, which we which, which believe is to be a bilayer. So the envelope of the virus. Then inside of that, there's a nucleocapsid proteins. So we have these nucleocapsid proteins. And the last thing that we have to understand here, which is also extremely significant, is the viral nucleic acid. Now there's two types of nucleic acid, DNA and RNA. Another thing is sometimes you can have what's called single-stranded nucleic acids. This is a single-stranded RNA. On top of that, if we want to even be more specific and go into the actual microbiology, virology aspect of this, it's called positive sense single-stranded RNA. So that's the other thing that I want you guys to know about the virus. So three big key points that I want you to take home with this whole virology structure here, the SARS-CoV-2 virus responsible for the disease COVID-19 is external proteins on the surface of it called spike protein, hemagglutin and esterase protein, necessary for attachment and fusion to host cells. Second thing is the single-stranded RNA that it puts into these host cells, which we're gonna see how that basically leads to specific proteins, enzymes, reassembling new viruses and destroying these cells and causing a massive cytokine storm, okay? So we understand the virus, we understand its structure, we understand the disease it causes. Where in the heck did this virus come from is the big question. And that's something that we don't completely know. What we do know and what research has shown is that there is a 96.2% genetic similarity 
between the bat coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2. So again, the bat coronavirus, RATG13, has a 96.2% genetic similarity to the beta coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. Could it be the, the one responsible for this virus? I don't know. The bat is a responsible for, it's a reservoir for tons of viruses. There is the potential. So there is the potential that this virus could have been transmitted from a bat to a human. There's also other research that said, well, what if there's an intermediate host? Who's that Pokemon, right? It could be some, it could be anything. We have no idea. They thought maybe it could be um, a civet. Maybe it could be a pangolin. We don't really know. What we think is, is that the bat coronavirus with this intermediate host might undergo a particular type of process which leads to the, this virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, having the ability to infect humans. What is that process called? We're not going to go into crazy detail, but I want you to understand it's called homologous recombination. So we call this homologous recombination. What is this? The most simplistic, easy way to explain this is, let's say here we have the virus from the bat. Okay, so here's gonna be a part of the bat coronavirus. And here is going to be the intermediate host. And this is a part of the virus, right? What we think is in that some way, shape or form, some of the genetic material from the bat coronavirus and the virus that is uh, within this intermediate host undergo some swapping of genetic material. So you see how here we have a pink portion of this genetic material, and here we have an orange port portion of this genetic material in the intermediate host. What we think is that there might be a little bit of swapping of some of the genetic material. And then look what we get here with this potential SARS-CoV-2 virus that might have the ability to infect humans. We see that there could be a little bit of a mixture of that two genetic components between these two structures here. That's what we think might be potentially responsible as well. But again, we're not completely sure. Another thing that there has been reports on this is again, this is news, this isn't journal articles that are specifically focused on this, but they think that there's a potential that this could have maybe de been developed within a lab in Wuhan that were studying bats particularly. Again, we don't know, but what I want you to understand is this is the evidence that we have so far as a potential source of the virus. Now that we understand where this virus could have potentially come from, we have to talk about one more thing because this has come up a lot in certain articles. All right, so the next thing that we have to understand is that the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we believe can come in two different types of flavors or subtypes, if you will. There's an S-type and an L-type. They believe that the S-type accounts for maybe 30% of the infections that have occurred with SARS-CoV-2 and that the L-type has accounted for approximately 70% of the infections caused by SARS-CoV-2. The next thing with the S-type, they say that the infections that individuals get from this subtype of the SARS-CoV-2 virus is less severe, okay, so less severe symptoms, and less aggressive. Okay, so that's a big, big point here that they mentioned in some of the research articles that we looked at. The other thing is the L-type, they believe that this virus, this subtype, is the one that is actually more, like, more common to cause the severe symptoms and to be potentially more aggressive in the host that it infects. But as you guys know, and if you've looked at a lot of the things in articles and on the news, some people can be infected with these viruses and be potentially asymptomatic or have very mild symptoms. So what they believe with the S-type SARS-CoV-2 virus is that this might be the virus that may be originated from a potential animal uh, component. So there might be some type of zoonotic connection here. So there might be a zoonotic connection. The other thing is the L-type, they believe that what happened is this S-type SARS-CoV-2 virus might have evolved into the L-type SARS-CoV-2 virus. So they think that this may have evolved from the S-type. 
So now the, what we understand from this virology aspect is SARS-CoV-2 virus is the virus that causes COVID-19. The two particular proteins on the outer surface is hemagglutinin and esterase and spike protein. They allow for attachment. The RNA that gets injected in is positive sense, single-stranded RNA, where we think it might have come from. It could either be a bat because of the 96.2% genetic similarity or homologous recombination be an intermediate host or again, potentially a lab, but we don't completely know that. And the last thing is there's two types of SARS-CoV-2, S-type, L-type. S-type is less severe, L-type more severe, more common for L-type, less common for S-type. And again, maybe a zoonotic association with the S-type, which over time may have evolved into the L-type. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we have to talk about the epidemiology with relation to this SARS-CoV-2 virus, because it's a big deal and it's one of the big things that are talked about right now. So the data that we have here that we're gonna talk about very briefly is from the John Hopkins data tracker system, okay? And again, this data is from 417, 2020, 638 Eastern Standard Time. We have data here in the top row and that's telling us from the time that we made our last video, March 15, 2020. The number of people who have been infected, the number of cases, 153,517. The fatality, the number of people who died, was 5,735. And then we can see that the case fatality rate based upon this divided by this is 3.7%. Now, and again, this is global data. We can see that as of today at 638, we can see that the incidence is 2,234,109 individuals infected with a fatality of 153,379. If we take the fatality and we divide it by the incidence, we'll give us our case fatality rate, which is around 6.9%. If you take the denominator, right, this is a pretty large denominator, but if we say that the number of incidents is larger because there's potentially people who aren't getting tested, because they're asymptomatic or they think that they might just have an upper respiratory tract infection, this incidence could potentially be a lot higher. So if we take the fatality that we have here and divide it by a larger number of incidents, potentially, again, if everybody was being tested, our case fatality rate could potentially be lower. But again, this is what we have as of right now. The next thing that we wanna talk about, instead of being so ominous right now, is we can see global recovery cases. So people who have been infected the number who have recovered is 567,695 individuals. So at least we can see some type of light in this very dark time. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at specific countries and specific areas and looking at their number of infected cases. As we can see here from the USA, the number of infected cases or number of people who have shown up with this COVID-19 diagnosis is 699,105 individuals. If we look at Spain, we can see that they have 188,167 total cases. If we look here at Italy, they have 172,434 total cases. If we look here at France, we have 147,121 cases. And Germany is 140,886 cases. So if you look at these and compare it to the USA, the USA has the highest number of cases at this point in time right now. All right, now that we understand a little bit of these statistics, let's now talk about a very relevant point when we talk about this virus. All right, the next thing that we have to talk about with um, this virus is its rate of transmission. And the rate of transmission of this virus is dependent upon two particular factors. And we talked about this in the last video. One is the r naught, which is the reproductive ratio. And the second thing is the series interval. Now, let's talk about this a little bit. What does all this mean? What is the, the reproductive ratio? Well, we talked about this last time. It's basically the ability of the virus in one infected individual, how many people can that infected individual pass that virus on to? And right now, the reproductive ratio is a range between two to four. In this example, we're actually gonna use an r naught of three, okay? Which falls right in between the two. So it's the average, the mean in this case. The other thing is this series interval. And the series interval is basically the time it takes from this infected individual to pass that virus and cause an infection of another individual, another patient in this case. So here's the problem with this. And 
we know that this virus can potentially infect individuals and they could be potentially asymptomatic, show no symptoms. So sometimes it can be very difficult to determine the series interval for them. And the only way that we could really do that if they're asymptomatic is to test them, utilizing RT-PCR, serology, utilizing ELISA, point of care, IgM, IgG that we'll talk about in a future video. But again, that's unnecessary if they're completely asymptomatic. We should save those tests for the true sick individuals and healthcare workers. So because of that, I want us to understand here that we're talking about a series interval with respect to individuals having symptoms. So how long is it before basically this individual infects another individual? How long after till they start becoming infected and potentially showing symptoms? Well, the series interval is an, we, sh we, we found a mean in one of the articles that showed it was potentially four days. So with that being said, we know that the R naught we're gonna utilize here is three. The time it takes for this one infected individual to infect three people is four days. The time it takes for these three individuals to go and infect three individuals on their own is four days. The time it takes for these nine individuals to go infect three individuals of their own takes four days. So if we take and sum this up, what do we have here? We're going to have a total of 12 days. So just less than two weeks, okay? The other thing is how many total individuals were infected? Well, we have one plus three plus nine plus 27. That gives us a total of 40 individuals infected. So within a period of 12 days, there was 40 individuals infected. So we can see here that if this is actually pretty serious and that's why we're seeing such a high incidence with this virus because it has a relatively smaller series interval and a relatively higher reproductive ratio. To look here at this graph again, we're basically just again talking a little bit about r naught because it's to give you an idea of how serious and how quickly this virus can spread. Here on the y-axis, we got people who have been infected, the number of cases. And on this x-axis, we have the time, okay? What we're gonna be looking at here is determining if with the R naught. So here we can see that this is an exponential curve here, right? And this tells us that the R naught is greater than one. Okay, because if the R naught is greater than one, we're gonna see exponential growth. And again, this is exponential growth when, with individuals who have been infected. If this case we take one that's kind of flatlining, it's not really causing an exponential growth, it's pretty much just kind of right along the, that mean line there, this is an R naught of one. So when we compare something like this, we say we have the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's pretty exponential growth with respect to this virus. If we take something like influenza, which R naughts maybe around 1.2, 1.5, that's relatively steady. We're not seeing a true exponential growth in individuals who've been infected. In comparison to COVID-19 who have been infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, we see some exponential rise in individuals infected. All right, so now let's go ahead and talk about the pathophysiology of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And again, that causes the disease COVID-19. What we need to do first is we understand the virology, the epidemiology, and again, the incubation period, which is basically the time from when the individual has been infected to when they potentially can start developing symptoms. They say that the mean is right around five days, but again, it could be anywhere from five days to potentially 14 days. Some articles even say potentially longer. What we need to know is how can this virus be transmitted, okay? And again, a lot of the research is showing that the primary way that this is being transferred is by respiratory droplets, okay? So one is via respiratory droplets. Now, this is basically when someone sneezes, whenever someone coughs, okay? These kinds of things. And even really interestingly, uh, one of the studies showed that this could potentially be spread through direct conversation. That's why they say that individuals should actually kind of maintain a distance if someone's kind of coughing or, you know, they're sneezing to try to maintain a distance of potentially greater than six feet. Another thing is that they say that this virus, there's also research that showed that this virus can potentially aerosolize. Okay, where it can actually kind of aerosolize within the particular environment for up to three hours. Okay, so up to three hours. 
Now, in addition to that, again, let's go back to this. They say that, yes, it potentially could be not just respiratory droplets, not just aerosolized up to uh, three hours, but again, there's newer data that says that this virus can travel up to greater than or equal to 25 feet, right? In less than a second. And that's pretty intense. When someone, let's say that they, um, they cough, they sneeze, anything like that, those respiratory droplets, they spray everywhere. And they land on particular surfaces. We're gonna call these fomites which is just basically certain surfaces. So these respiratory droplets or anything like that, so fomite surfaces, so let's say that someone sneezes, they cough, they touch a part of any part of their mucous membrane and they touch any of these following surfaces here. The virus has the potential to be on these surfaces for a certain amount of time where it can still infect an individual. How long? Well, if we look here, aluminum, latex, copper, for up to eight hours. Cardboard, potentially, 24 hours. Countertops, plastic, stainless steel, one to three days. And glass and wood, five days. So this is why it's important to make sure that you're cleaning a lot of the surfaces that you touch around your house. If you have someone that is sick, this is one of the other ways that this virus can be transmitted. So it's not just respiratory droplets directly, but it can be via indirect via fomite surfaces. Because this virus is genetically similar to the MERS and SARS virus, they were also responsible for shedding the virus in the stool and potentially transmitting it via a fecal oral route. Why? Because of being genetically similar to the SARS virus of 2002, 2003, and the MERS virus in 2012. There was also some research that was done that suggested this could potentially be transmitted from mother to fetus. There was four studies that were done. One of the studies did show that there was one of the babies who did get the SARS-CoV-2 virus from the mother. But again, there wasn't enough in that research to truly back up that this could be a vertical transmission type of process. Is there potential? We need more research to really determine that. But as of right now, the main way that these viruses are spread, respiratory droplets, aerosolized, can travel pretty quick, pretty far, fomite surfaces, and potentially fecal oral route. All right, so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how this virus particularly infects cells. Now, what I want you to remember is that this virus can infect multiple different cells. Last time in the previous COVID-19 video, we talked about how it primarily affects the lungs because that's all that we really knew about it at that time. Now what we're seeing is that there's ACE2 receptors where the virus binds on multiple tissues in the body. For example, on the organs up here that we're gonna talk about in a little. But we're just gonna make a small little update or changes to again, how this virus infects the actual um, lung cells and how this can produce a massive cytokine storm as well as some of the updated symptoms and changes, okay? So here we have the SARS-CoV-2 virus, right? Here's our SARS. CoV-2 virus. When this virus comes, remember it has that spike protein and that hemagglutinin and esterase protein, which we said are necessary for the fusion or attachment of the virus to the host cell. What is this host cell? Well, remember in the last time we made this video, it was the type two pneumocytes, okay? And those are present in the lungs, okay? Once this virus binds onto a particular receptor, what did we say the receptor was the last time? ACE2, okay? It binds here. There's also another protein that they believe to be responsible for this fusion and then allowing for the virus to enter into the cell. This research has shown that there is what's called a transmembrane serine protease. Okay, so a transmembrane serine protease type 2. These are the two proteins they believe to be responsible for the attachment fusion of the virus and therefore entry into the cell. Once the virus binds here, it then gets taken into the cell via what's called an endocytosis mechanism. 
Now it's brought into the cell, into this vesicle. Once into this vesicle, it's then going to have to uncoat and release out of this actual viral envelope the particular nucleic acid. And this nucleic acid, as we already talked about, is a positive sense single-stranded RNA. Now, this positive sense single-stranded RNA, once it's released out into the cytoplasm, it then can go and bind onto ribosomes. Now, these ribosomes can be present on two places. One is they can be cytosolic, so free, or they can be bound to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Once the ssRNA moves through the ribosome, it gets translated and makes particular proteins. Some of the proteins we have here, these are called polyproteins. And these polyproteins are the initial units that we're gonna use to make spike proteins, hemagglutinin and esterase proteins, M proteins, envelope proteins, and nucleocapsid proteins. What are those important for? The virus structure. On top of that, it's also gonna make a very important enzyme that we need. This enzyme over here, this cute little enzyme, is called a RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And what this enzyme does, and it's very cool, it takes RNA, right? So we have the RNA, that single-stranded, that positive sense, positive sense single-stranded RNA. And what we're gonna do is, we're gonna use this RNA-dependent RNA polymerase to take this RNA and to make more RNA. And again, if you really wanna be specific, what happens is, is it takes the positive sense single-stranded RNA, turns it into a negative sense, and then again, back into a positive sense. But the whole purpose here is that we're making more RNA. Why is that important? Because if we make more RNA, we use the host cell's ribosomes to make more polyproteins, more enzymes to make more RNA, and if we have more RNA, more polyproteins that eventually get broken down via what enzyme? Protein aces down into the initial units, which again are the spike protein, we'll put S here, the M protein, the hemagglutinin esterase protein, or the E protein in our nucleocapsid proteins, if we then have the single-stranded RNA combining with these proteins and then transporting them into the Golgi where they all get packaged into a vesicle, reassembled, and now we just made a new virus. And from the Golgi, it's gonna butt off, and here inside of this actual lipid bilayer, we have our virus. Then what's gonna happen is this virus, like lipid bilayer, which is a part of this vesicle, will fuse with the cell membrane. And via the process of exocytosis, we're gonna release this virus out of the cell. But in the process of doing that, and us building up all these viruses in the cell, the problem with that is eventually, this is gonna cause death of cells. And what type of cells? The type two pneumocytes. So what do we just do here? Well, we basically described, here's our alveolus, right? So we're zooming into a particular part of the lungs called the alveolus. Here we have type two pneumocytes. We already talked about this in our previous COVID-19 video, right? But what happens is when these type two alveolar cells are damaged, they start to release a bunch of different types of molecules. One is called interferons. And particularly, if you really want to know, they're called alpha and beta interferons. What's the overall significance of these interferons? They just tell nearby healthy alveolar cells, like the type two alveolar cells and type one alveolar cells, that there's a virus in the vicinity. Start increasing the synthesis of antiviral peptides. And if you do that, potentially, what that might do is if the virus infects those cells, we'll have antiviral peptides to break down that virus. That's a part of our immune system function. The other thing is whenever these cells are damaged, they start to release what's called damage associated molecular patterns, as well as a lot of inflammatory cytokines. And what these cytokines do is they alert an alveolar macrophage in the vicinity. So here's our cute little alveolar macrophage. And he has been activated by these damage associated molecular patterns or these inflammatory cytokines. 
when he's activated, he starts to secrete a lot of very potent inflammatory mediators. What are some of these? Well, one of them is called interleukin-1. Another is called interleukin-6. And then interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, and even a little bit of gamma interferons. What in the heck do all these molecules do? They do a ton of stuff. To be very simplistic, because we talked about this in the previous video, the interleukin-1, interleukin-6, TNF-alpha, some of them move out into this little pulmonary capillary area. And they cause the endothelial cells of this vascular system to kind of move closer together, which causes spaces to form within the pulmonary capillaries. And as a result of that, guess what starts happening? fluid starts leaking out of these capillary spaces and as the fluid starts leaking out into these capillary spaces what is that called as fluid starts leaking in between the pulmonary capillaries and the alveolus like membrane this is called interstitial edema on top of that some of the fluid from the interstitium might start moving into the alveoli and this is called alveolar edema why is this a problem? It's super simple. We talked about it previously. Remember that in order for gases to move, they need a very thin respiratory membrane. We talked about that in physiology. And what respiratory gas moves? Well, remember we have oxygen that moves from the alveolus into the blood. Well, if because this membrane is so much thicker, that means less oxygen is moving into the blood. What do we call that whenever there's less oxygen in the blood? Whenever there's less partial pressure of arterial oxygen, it's called hypoxemia. This is a potential effect that can result out of this. So one of the things that this can do is this increased PaO2, I'm sorry, this decreased PaO2 can lead to hypoxemia. The other effect that I want you to remember here is not only can that happen, but over time, as the lungs start really struggling and aren't able to breathe as quick and the, the muscles start getting weak, the CO2 is also going to have a hard time being able to get out of the blood and into the alveoli and then escape out into the air that we breathe out. And as that happens, that means that the CO2 in the blood starts building up. When the PCO2 in the blood starts building up, what do we call that? hypercapnia or hypercarbia. It's whichever one you prefer. And this is called hypercarbia. We'll just use hypercarbia. The problem with hypercarbia is that as CO2 levels build up in the blood, guess what this can do? This can lead to the conversion of carbonic acid and that can break down into protons. What are protons? They're acid. And that can make the blood acidic and potentially progress to respiratory acidosis. So that's a concern of this is that this could lead to respiratory acidosis. Now remember, this is after the lungs have really started to like really fail and they're not able to clear that CO2. Initially, the person's gonna be breathing really heavy, trying to get some of that CO2 out. So if they're getting a lot of CO2 out initially, they might actually be alkalotic. But over time, the fear is that they'll become acidotic. All right, so we have two effects here that we've already talked about, hypoxemia and hypercarbia with the potential of it progressing to respiratory acidosis. Hypoxemia, the thing with this is this can lead to shortness of breath because we're not getting enough oxygen delivered to the tissues. Okay, the next thing, the interleukin-1, interleukin-6, all these cytokines, they also can act on the vascular endothelium and they can increase the expression of particular types of proteins. These proteins are called VCAMs. What is the whole significance of this? If we increase the expression of what's called vascular cell adhesion molecules, you know white blood cells love to move through this area. And as they're moving through this area, the only way that they can get to this area of inflammation is if they have adhesion molecules that attach to them and pull them in. Well, if we increase the expression of these VCAMs, now there's more of these molecules to bind to the white blood cells circulating through this area and pull them in to this area of inflammation that's caused by this virus. And so now from there, we pull into the area some neutrophils and we pull into the area some more macrophages, which will just perpetuate the inflammatory response. 
Now, the next thing that can happen here is that these inflammatory cytokines can also activate neutrophils. And here's where it starts getting a little bit nasty. These neutrophils, they are very helpful, but also at the same time, they don't always cause the best response that we want. What do I mean? Whenever the neutrophils are activated, particularly by interleukin-8, they start secreting particular types of molecules, like reactive oxygen species, as well as proteases. And the problem with these molecules is that they're trying to destroy whatever thing is causing the inflammation, but unfortunately, they also damage the surrounding parenchymal tissue. And because of that, they're gonna damage the type two alveolar cells even more and damage the type one alveolar cells. Why is that a problem? Well, think about this. If I decrease the number of type one cells, what is that important for? Will they play a role within gas exchange? Well, if I damage them, won't I potentially decrease my gas exchange process? Yeah. And because of that, won't that mean that I'll have less oxygen moving from the alveoli into the blood, less CO2 moving from the blood to the alveoli? Yeah. So that could potentially lead to hypoxemia. And again, hypoxemia can potentially lead to shortness of breath. If I damage the type two alveolar cells, so now I have decreased type two cells because of this reactive oxygen species or the virus itself. They play a role with surfactant. So now I decrease surfactant production because they're damaged. If I decrease surfactant, what does that do? That increases surface tension. And if I increase surface tension, that leads to an increased pressure that's gonna to wanna to collapse the alveoli. So that's called increased alveolar collapse. And with that increased alveolar collapse, that's gonna to lead to less oxygen moving from the, blood, from the cells, the alveolus, into the blood, and less CO2 moving from the blood to the alveolus to get exhaled. That can potentially progress to hypoxemia. And that hypoxemia can lead to the symptom that we see, which is shortness of breath, okay? So we can get the shortness of breath from the interstitial alveolar edema or damage to these cells. Here's the next thing that the newer research is showing, which is actually really scary with this virus. This inflammatory or what we call cytokine storm, because this alveolar macrophage is blasting out a lot of these uh, molecules here. One of the things that they're seeing is that these cytokines can increase the activity of what's called procoagulants. And what are procoagulants? Procoagulants are basically molecules that are going to want to promote clot formation. But at the same time, guess what else it does? It decreases the anticoagulant activity. So if I decrease anticoagulant activity and increase the activity of the procoagulants, what's that gonna to lead to? A clot. So now because of that, this can potentially lead to pulmonary emboli, which are just basically little clots that form within the pulmonary circulation. This is another scary effect that we don't wanna see, but this can come up in the real severe cases of this disease. Okay, the next thing that I wanna talk about, because these alveolar cells are damaged, right? Be either because of the reactive oxygen species, the proteases, or the virus itself, they start to release, again, more of these inflammatory cytokines. Like what? Well, they release things like leukotrienes, okay? They release things like prostaglandins and other different types of molecules, maybe bradykinins, things like that. What do these inflammatory cytokines do? I'm glad you asked, guys. What they do is they can activate particular receptors that are connected to the vagus nerve. Here's your cranial nerve, 10. These receptors pick up inflammatory stimuli, noxious stimuli, send that information to the central nervous system, and our central nervous system generates what's called a cough reflex to potentially move whatever thing is causing that inflammation. So this will generate a cough reflex. And the thing with this cough reflex is that we find that it's most of the time 
a dry cough, and sometimes, in about 33% of the situations, it can be a productive cough. But again, more commonly, it's going to be a dry cough. In addition, these leukotrienes also act on the bronchial smooth muscle. And when they act on the bronchial smooth muscle, they induce what's called bronchoconstriction. And the problem with bronchoconstriction is that decreases the oxygen that's moving into the alveoli and it decreases the CO2 that's leaving the alveoles because it's really narrow. And because of that, that can lead to hypoxemia, potentially exacerbating the already shortness of breath. Now, here's the next thing that we have to talk about. Remember that we said that all of this inflammation within the lungs can potentially start spreading out into the systemic circulation, potentially leading to systemic inflammatory response syndrome. Well, that's where one of these really dangerous things that can happen. Remember, we said that there's the potential of this leading to SIRS. Well, SIRS is systemic inflammatory response syndrome. What if those cytokines increase the procoagulant activity within the systemic circulation? and they decrease the anticoagulant activity in the systemic circulation. Oh boy, this ain't good. Because what this can do is this can lead to multiple clots within the systemic circulation. And as you start to form multiple clots within the systemic circulation, what happens? Well, you start consuming your coagulation proteins. As you start to consume so many coagulation proteins, whenever you need to clot, you can't. And what is this called? This is called disseminated intravascular coagulation and this is a concern right now all right the next thing that i want you guys to remember here and the last symptom because we've covered cough we've covered shortness of breath we've covered the risk of pe dic uh, massive cytokine storm but again that interleukin one and that tnf alpha can also move through the circulation and act on the central nervous system particularly the hypothalamus, and increase what's called prostaglandin E2 production. And that basically can lead to increasing our body's thermostat temperature, right? And that can potentially lead to a fever, which is another symptom that we have to be wary of, right? So hypoxemia, cough, fever, right? These are things that we have to worry about, and hypoxemia particularly is shortness of breath, all right? Now, how can this virus affect other cells directly or indirectly via multi-system organ failure? Well, first thing that we're starting to see is that some people can potentially present with very mild symptoms or asymptomatic. We think that the virus might have the ability to infect the olfactory cells and the gustatory cells. What does that mean? If I decrease the olfactory cells, I potentially decrease smell. And if I decrease smell, that could potentially be a symptom, hypoanosmia or anosmia. If I damage the taste receptors, I might lead to decreased gustation or decreased taste. In addition to that, they're also seeing that some individuals, it might actually infect the mucosa of the pharynx, leading to pharyngitis, which is basically sore throat. Now, we already see what it could do to the lungs. It can infect the lungs, potentially inducing a viral pneumonia. That viral pneumonia could potentially become acute respiratory distress syndrome. That acute respiratory distress syndrome that can develop here can over time potentially progress to systemic inflammatory response syndrome. And that systemic inflammatory response syndrome can potentially progress to multi-system organ failure. And to add on this other symptom that we're also concerned about, or this other condition, is you also have to worry about the potential of pulmonary embolisms now. Okay, pulmonary embolism. The next thing is we know that this virus can also potentially damage the cardiac tissue directly or via the multi-system organ failure route. And because of that, that can lead to decreased cardiac function. And this decreased cardiac function might lead to a specific type of condition called cardiomyopathy. Okay? The other thing that we're thinking is that this virus can also infect the GI tract, potentially altering the ability for absorption, secretion, and motility. And because of that, that might lead to abdominal pain. In addition to the abdominal pain, 
This might also lead to nausea, vomiting, and maybe even diarrhea. In addition to that, we think that there might be also ACE2 receptors on the kidney. And if we're damaging the kidney cells, this could lead to decreased kidney function. So if we decrease the renal function, that might lead to a symptoms of oliguria, which is decreased urine production, potentially maybe even anuria, no urine production. And that's scary. The last thing is we think that there might be ACE2 proteins that are present on the liver cells. And if the damage is the liver cells, this can lead to decreased liver function. And we don't even need to begin to say whenever there's decreased liver function, that can lead to a range of metabolic disorders. The last thing I want to talk about here is how the SARS-CoV-2 virus might alter the ACE2 activity and how that controls angiotensin II production. Very simply, with this virus, we're down-regulating the ACE2 proteins, right? So if there is decreased... ACE2, what they think that this is responsible for doing is that ACE2 is basically responsible for inhibiting angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 production. But if you have decreased ACE2 levels, that means that there's going to be less inhibition of this pathway. And because of that, there might be more stimulation of conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. The problem with this is that with elevated angiotensin II levels, they're seeing that this might be what's responsible for the acute lung injury. So again, SARS-CoV-2 virus is potentially down-regulating the ACE2 proteins, decreasing the um, level of that presence, and then leading to increased angiotensin II production because of no inhibition, and that can potentially be responsible for the acute lung injury via increased vascular permeability, hypertension, and inflammation. All right, engineers, so in this video, we cover COVID-19 caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I hope this video made sense. I hope that you guys did enjoy it. If you guys did, hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Down in the description box, we'll have links to our Facebook, Instagram, Patreon account, as well as our GoFundMe. Go check out that. All right, engineers, as always, keep safe, and as always, until next time.